Welcome to Whiskey Lore, the interviews. I'm your host, Drew Hanish, the Amazon bestselling author of Whiskey Lore's Travel Guide to Experiencing Irish Whiskey and Experiencing Kentucky Bourbon. And today, it is time to bridge the divide between wine and whiskey with my guest, Adam Edmondson. Adam is the general manager of Sommelier Company, a master of scotch with the Council of Whiskey Masters, and a certified specialist of wine with the Society of Wine Educators. And a couple weeks ago, Adam reached out to me on behalf of the Council of uh, Whiskey Masters and was asking me if there were some of the people who were uh, on, on their advisory board that maybe we could have on the show at some point to talk history, which I would love to do. But as we were chatting, it was like, wait a second, this is a really interesting conversation that we're having about wine and whiskey. And it's interesting for me because it's something that I started actually wanting to go from beer into wine, and I ended up in whiskey. So it's uh, it seems like a path that some people will take to get to that final destination of whiskey. And so uh, I thought we'd have a great time talking about that. Adam, welcome to the show. Wonderful. Thank you for having me, Drew. Yeah, this is uh, it's a it's a very interesting topic for me because, as I say. Um, my journey was to say, wait a second, it started with a movie with me. It was the movie Sideways. And when I saw it, I was like, okay, this guy knows all this stuff about wine. He can, I'm a James Bond fan too. And uh, there, there are times in, in the early James Bonds where Sean Connery goes off on a particular spirit and starts telling you the whole backstory on it. It's like, that's really cool. I can't really do that with beer. I would love to do that with wine. Uh, but wine evolved into whiskey for me. So let's talk first about your journey and how did you first get to wine? Because I'm assuming wine came before whiskey. It did. Wine came before whiskey. And actually, um, interestingly, it started with when I moved to California. I'm originally from the Midwest, from Kansas City. I, I moved to California about 12 years ago, uh, maybe 13 years now. And um, right away, I started going to wine tastings. Um, people assume when I say that that it's California wines, but actually the tastings I went to had a really global focus and a pretty systematic approach. Um, so the the founder of that tasting group um, was a sommelier. Many sommeliers attended those tastings along with collectors and hobbyists. So it was a pretty high level conversation. Um, it wasn't focused on, there was no promotion. It's not focused on the producers. It was critical discussion, blind tasting um, in every tasting. Um, so. Mm the wines were tasted and discussed before revealing what they were and that was an excellent way to learn a lot about wine is um, hearing people's reasoning out loud um, and you know argumentation with each other and and keeping it an interesting game um, essentially um, that allows you to pick up lots of little facts here and there um, prior to that i mean i i studied abroad in europe so i'd i'd had wine before i was uh, of drinking age in the u.s um, and I would say my my pop culture reference was um, when Hannibal Lecter was uh, serve, serving a seven hundred dollar bottle of Mont Rocher. <laughs> okay, that works. I don't know that you <laughs> want to pair anything that he would pair with his, but <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, that's interesting. That so uh, so you were introduced to the uh, sommelier um, concept very early on in your experience. Yeah, I was 21 at the time when I when I went to sommelier led tastings, and um, I I got my certification in wine um, from the Society, Society of Wine Educators. Uh, by the time I was 23, um, but even before then, was um, essentially co-hosting those tastings. After a while, um, we had we had three different uh, groups in three different cities. So we we were in L.A., San Diego, and Orange County. Um, once basically at three Saturdays out of the month and so I was tasting you know through much more than most people get access to tasting if you're in the trade or, or something like that unless you go to a lot of large trade tastings and so just the exposure and the, I'd say the methodology um, you know really hooked me pretty quickly to making this an intellectual topic and something to um, you know savor beyond just the the physical uh, sense of that term <laughs> Were, were your parents wine drinkers, or uh, did you just kind of stumble into this yourself? No, polar opposite. I mean, I don't, I don't think they had ever purchased a bottle of wine. Um, there was boxed wine at family events. It was not anything in the family, really. Um, it was just, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd studied, um, you know, a lot of culture and things like that before 
um, before having moved out here. I had I'd lived in Europe. I had, you know, um, I learned German as a second language and knew a lot, knew a bit more about European history and so on. So I, food and wine and, and kind of the interest of all, all those things came together. I'm pretty interested in food as well. Leap for milch. That's what my parents drank. Oh, no. <laughs> the, yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of blue nun we had around the house. Yeah, so yes. we were, I mean, ger German background for me. So what was interesting to me was the first time I got to go to uh, the Alsace-Lorraine region and right there on the border of France and Germany. And uh, I, I've been so exposed to red wine when I started my journey into wine a few years ago. And it was kind of interesting to jump back to white wine again and and have that experience. Did you have a preference when you started? Did you did you jump into the whites first or the reds or kind of equal opportunity? It's interesting. People kind of, I think, go through phases um, with that. I had a few years where I was only interested in white wines um, after after blasting through, um, you know, all the red wines I could for uh, the beginning. I, mean, I think I think in the beginning, red wines were more interesting to me. There is more to find in them and to say about them in general. Um, you're adding a production method that increases flavor or produces flavor and texture, and there's a bit more to it. But um, I would say, I mean, if you went to a great place for finding really complex white wines. And so when I was introduced to Alsatian white wines, German white wines, um, some of the Rhone Valley white wines that can just be amazingly complex and interesting, you see, okay, you know, these things don't all taste like one another, which I think for a beginning taster, it can seem like the whites tend to blur together a bit more than some of the reds do. So it has to be sort of daunting, I guess, at the beginning when you're getting into this. Are you, when you're attending events and doing things like that, are, you feel like people are talking over your head initially. I think that stops a lot of people from really wanting to dive in to learning about either whiskey or wine. Yeah, I think, I mean, you're trusting the presenter or the, the host or whoever's leading and kind of designing the, the format of a tasting like that. And that really, um, the, so the sommelier company, which is the company I, I operate now um, as the general manager, um, it actually grew out of those tasting events, um, which were hobby tasting events, but people started asking the, uh, the founder to do private events. And so that eventually became a company doing corporate and private events um, and consulting and things like that. But uh, that began with having someone who can, you know, appropriately set the context for someone who's new to tasting wine, while at the same time not making people who have 30 years of experience feel like they're starting with Wine 101. Um, so it's, you know, you're mentioning facts here and there that, you know, um, people who are new are picking up, but at the same time you're reminding people who already know them. Do you start out kind of talking about regions? And I, I, I try to relate all of this to the way that I teach somebody about scotch. And I, I talk about regions now. Of course, regions in scotch are not quite as distinct as they had been for, for some time. But, um, but still, is that kind of where you start? It's like I want to figure out where to um, ground myself. Mm -hmm. so that I don't feel overwhelmed by all of this. Yeah, and that when people, you know, when publishers um, design books or encourage writers to design books a certain way, the typically it's divide things into region. People have already been trained by wine to think that way. And um, for wine, the reason for regionality is much more inherent than the reason for regional characteristics in whiskey. There's much more on the production side of the equation in whiskey. Um, certainly there are environmental um, factors and things that um, influence how they can develop, but the, I would say with wine, it's quite a bit easier um, to divide the world up into places, um, which naturally have boundaries and divisions. And then to think also in the dimension of grape variety, because grape variety plus region um, maybe plus style, if there's a distinctive style of winemaking or, or grape growing, um, is really the identity of a wine. Whereas the identity of a whiskey is a much more complicated thing, I would say. So 
was sommelier uh, something that when you first got into this, there was actually a certification for, or was it a title you just kind of, uh, pe people tagged you with that after a while if they, if you really knew your stuff? Yeah, I mean, the traditional use of the word was a, a, a job function in a restaurant. Um, so it's it was something that, you know, a French restaurant had a sommelier, um, kind of in the height of uh, French cuisine. Um, all, any nice restaurant would have a sommelier. And then there were, I don't know if the Court of Master Sommeliers was the first to come up with um, any type of certification of this kind. I don't, um, I don't believe they are, but I'm not sure. But they really... Um, got it to be associated with a certification um, by certifying sommeliers that's one of the titles they offer and then um, advanced and master and um, I think many people are familiar with the phenomenon of master sommeliers because um, there have been documentaries like Psalm and um, books and TV shows and things that um, kind of look into this specialized world of people whose mission is to know literally everything about wine um, you know, even comically sometimes to the point of, you know, beyond any practical use in a, in a restaurant, <laughs> but, um, you know, memorizing lists and things like that. But I think the, um, yeah, it's, it's gotten to be associated with certifications. There are other certifications that don't use the term, like mine um, is a certified specialist of wine with the Society of Wine Educators, and that really just indicates an educational focus, um, someone who wants to teach about wine rather than um, a service and hospitality focus, which was the purpose of the court and, and, uh, and some other organizations. So this has really helped people kind of move beyond just being an individual restaurant and actually go around and do tastings in other places and be more mobile. Yeah, the profession of sommelier outside of a restaurant is still a new thing. Um, so we, um, for, long, for the longest time, have been really the only company that does that nationwide as far as bringing sommeliers in front of audiences uh, outside of a restaurant setting. Um, there are other people who have been doing that individually and kind of built their own um, career doing so in specific cities, but it's, um, it's something that was relatively new 10 years ago. Okay. So... I know my audience is going whiskey, whiskey. When's he going to talk whiskey, about whiskey? whiskey. Let, let's yeah, let's uh, let's jump in and say what was it? Um, uh, because as I say, for me, wine was something that I enjoyed. My issue was that because I was single and you know I'd buy a bottle of wine, I felt like I had to drink a bottle of wine, and I was one who was really starting to get into the idea of nosing and tasting, and so I didn't necessarily want a big glass of wine i just wanted something i could nose and taste and not feel guilty that uh, i hadn't put my little air compress compressor to work to try to save the bottle and all the rest or buy the fancy corks and all that sort of stuff so that was kind of my transition over to whiskey was here's something that i can just pour myself a little bit of i can nose it i can taste it um that kind of thing so what was it that that brought you over to whiskey yeah, so I mean, there was a time I would have said I'm not interested in spirits, and I'm not interested in being interested in spirits. <laughs> I mean, it would yep. I, as a as somebody who who cared a lot about balance and and you know the other virtues you look for in wine. You're thinking forty plus percent alcohol. Well, you know that's that's a big elephant in the room. How are you going to manage flavor with that level of alcohol, etc. And you know, my, my it dawned on me when I became. Um, when it became useful for me to learn about whiskey was uh, really when people started requesting whiskey tasting events um, uh, who you know previously would have uh, requested a wine tasting event and I really studied it um, for for a while and um, I would I would say the thing that really made it dawn on me that you know this is something that can be just as complex just as you know delicate just as uh, flavor some interesting intellectual um, it was when I really had uh, a kind of a high end tasting. You know, it's sometimes you actually have to start at the at the higher end of the spectrum to to be grabbed by the lapels and see what what's possible for this type of beverage. Because the tendency is to think you should start at the beginning, which is the bottom shelf stuff, and then work your way up. But the problem is some of the bottom shelf stuff isn't interesting enough to keep you interested in the topic. So um, one of the first single malt scotch tastings I did that had lots of aged things, um, you know, 18 year, 21 year, 25 year, things like that, um, that I was leading from a sommelier's perspective, just blew my mind, you know, with the, mm. 
the complexity in particular and just the clarity of flavor and just the beauty. I think the reason why you could probably step beyond the entry levels is because the entry levels are probably going to offend you a little bit. They're they're going to be rougher. They're they're really not going to help ease you into that whiskey world whereas you already have a developed nose and palate and so you're more prepared whereas when I started in whiskey I was like you know what I don't want to drink a $200 bottle of whiskey because I feel like it's wasted on me. I haven't really mm -hmm. trained my nose or palate yet and I need to start with a quality spirit, but not one that is necessarily uh, going to you know break the bank and that I'm going to feel guilty drinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think you need to you know have something that's a little over your head that you can really see. Oh my God, there's something here, um, and then kind of aspire to understanding it and become more fascinated in how it's made. Um, what's, what makes it different from other whiskeys? Why is there such a variety of flavor in something that seems like it's simple coming from just a few ingredients? And yeah, I would say people go in phases too. Um, like I said, you know, I had a white wine phase. I also had a, you know, younger whiskey phase. So if I, you know, was starting with um, low age statement or no age statement bottlings and couldn't really appreciate them at the beginning, um, you know, maybe I learned enough and began to appreciate whiskey enough through um, higher end selections that then I'm circling back and saying, well, there's a lot of merit. Um, to most of the whiskeys that are on the market. They're not occupying shelf space for no reason. Um, we don't actually get much bad whiskey. Mm. And so did you get used to over 40%? <laughs> I did, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, yes, uh, and now I'm, now, I'm, now I'm, you know, demanding 46, et cetera. So. Right, yeah, aren't we yeah. all, aren't we all? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's kind of an interesting progression. I think actually in some ways I watch people who are drinking cast strength whiskeys now and, and, and are like they're grabbing for as much as they can possibly get out of that bottle um, that, as you say, we go through phases and maybe this is part of a phase that, we, you know, people want to get the most aggressive they can get out of it uh, to see where it goes. And then at some point potentially kind of pull back and, and find that sweet spot. Yeah, yeah, I found, um, you know, it's not only the the alcohol, the, the warmth, um, I find too that, you know, when you have a higher proof whiskey, it seems to carry the flavor better. Um, not only that it's not losing a lot of that um, in the process of, of proofing, but uh, it just, it seems like a little higher alcohol um, kind of presents the flavors a little bit better. Um, so I am tasting quite a bit at a higher strength than I would have before. If I had bought a, a cast strength whiskey before, I would have watered it down to effectively 40, 43, something like that. Um, but, but yeah, I am, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of in a cast strength phase right now, I would say. <laughs> did you, uh, uh, did you gravitate more towards finished whiskeys when you started out just because of the familiarity? I, I did only actually for the reason that I was so impressed with Glenmorangie. Um, and so that was one of the whiskeys I really enjoyed was the Glenmorangie 18. And um, so I went and bought things that they have in the rest of their, um, you know, their, their core range um, and some special bottlings. But most of those, you know, being varied by the different finishes. So was it, uh, was it scotch only or when did you start uh, kind of trying different areas uh coming over to american whiskey maybe trying some irish whiskey all of that yeah i mean i think i i i began tasting bourbon about the same time as i did scotch so i would say my interest was much more in scotch and it has been to date um that was the program i decided to go through with the council um the master program and um my plans for the future though i am going for the uh, master of whiskey designation which is the uh, basically to cover the entire world. Um, so right now I'm focused a lot on, on bourbon and Japanese, um, catching up on my knowledge of Irish, Canadian, um, you know, other world whiskeys. Uh, but yeah, I think scotch is, scotch is still to me kind of the, the thing that means the most. It's interesting jumping in and I, I have really tried to encourage people to stretch themselves and go beyond. What I'm finding is that as I start tasting Irish whiskeys now, and I've tasted some Canadian whiskeys that I hadn't really tried before, and I'm going into these different areas, you 
you see different personalities evolving in each of these kind of like we talk about with with wine you know different regions kind of have their own personalities that uh, there's characteristics there's the way they make the whiskey in a particular place what they pay attention to um that it, it just seems to open up um your uh well just opening up the knowledge and and getting to know all of that i think just makes you a a smarter whiskey drinker overall mm -hmm. yeah and if you want to understand the different styles it's important to understand the different um, regulations about how they're produced and those came up you know out of most legislation is is custom before it's legislation so those come out of tradition but they also act as constraints and so they are they're actually uh, in a way also inhibitors to competition um, in, in the sense that if you're if you're trying to figure out how to compete with scotch you know you're able to do things that the scotch producers can't do um, by by definition and so you can carve out your own marketplace and that's becoming interesting in, in many places around the world where they're looking at different ways of innovating Scotland at the same time is innovating continually um, within the constraints of its regulations but these are kind of fascinating interplays you know the culture the um, competitive forces tradition uh, regulations um, Understand it, learning to understand those and kind of understand um, the different the different uh, styles that result from them. That's I think really fascinating. Once you get past your kind of region of choice and you're and you start tasting other things. I mean, Japanese whiskey was a revelation to me. I mean, they're just the quality available there is astounding. Um, same thing with many other places around the world, but they're so different, you know, from Scotch. Yeah. We'll get into uh, talking about blind tasting here in a little bit because I think that's an interesting subject and trying to figure these regions out and or, or these these different countries and and their styles. Uh, but let's talk first about the f first thing that you have to do, which is really kind of developing uh, a nose and palate uh, when you're first starting out. And again, it can be kind of that overwhelming feeling to some people when they start. I know when I started my channel, I started it as a history channel and I was never going to do tastings. And the reason I was never going to do tastings is because I was one of those people that said, ah, I'll never be great at that. That's something that, you know, only uh, masters can really do. And I'm just going to sit back here and, and, and tell history and I'll sip on something and I'll apologize for how little I know about <laughs> T tasting whiskey um but then after a while it caught on and so um if you were to give somebody some advice who is uh who's who's going you know what i i apologize all the time for the fact that i you know i i can't tell you what this tastes like you know if they go to a, a i would travel to a distillery and i would have the master distiller looking at me and I would have this glass and I know he's going to ask me what I'm nosing and tasting out of this or what I'm experience, experiencing. And then it's just kind of this overwhelming feeling of, mm -hmm. oh, you know what? I'm going to say it tastes like vanilla and caramel because it's a bourbon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, how do how do you um, how do you start yourself out in trying to expand your palate? Yeah, I think, I mean, before you see individual tasting notes, you do actually have to have quite a bit of experience just tasting whiskey, not necessarily widely, even a given whiskey. If you have, you know, over the course of six months, a bottle of whiskey, you're going to start noticing things about it beyond kind of the base impression. And, but you have to have that time and exposure to start noticing those things. So, the, the truthful answer, if somebody asks a novice, what do you smell? They're going to say whiskey. <laughs> you know, yeah. it just smells like whiskey. That sounds like a funny answer, but it's the true answer because that's what you see. And you're differentiating whiskey from, from water, from Coca-Cola, from whatever else. And then once you've had a lot of whiskey, then you start differentiating one type of whiskey from the next and one tasting note from the next. And part of observing tasting notes, too, is more cognitive than it is sensory perceptual. So most people have very similar palates. There are people who have, um, in terms of their equipment, have you know many more taste buds. You know They have some advantage in that way. 
but those people are rare and they're not generally the best tasters in the world. The best tasters in the world are people with normal palates who've learned kind of what to do with their mind while they're tasting. And asking yourself questions, knowing how it's produced, knowing which questions you know should be coming up to you to, to, to try to identify something goes a long way. It's much easier to go down a checklist than it is trying to observe things just inductively from scratch without any kind of foil or, or uh, without any kind of uh, comparison. So I think that's that's part of how, you know, a tasting note from a sommelier can be so impressive. They've got kind of a rubric and, and a lot of a lot of background in terms of um, intentionally thinking about different tasting notes and, you know, going to the grocery store, buying fruits you wouldn't normally buy, going to the floral department, um, smelling and tasting spices, you know, eating foods that are different from what you normally would. Those are the kinds of things you can do to expand your repertoire. It's really interesting because whiskey really taught me how to taste and smell because I really had not paid that much attention to the food or the smells around me. There could be a smell going on around and I was just totally oblivious to it. And now I'm to the point where I even when I drink water, I know what water feels like. And so yeah. it's like you taste what a whiskey, the body of a whiskey, you start paying attention to those smaller details. And um, and when I started out, I was like, should I just go to the store and buy a bunch of different spices and, <laughs> you know, be nosing them and, and trying to, to pick things up that way. Uh, and there there is sort of that overwhelming feeling once you get started that, uh, especially if you start into scotch, because the flavor range is greater, uh, sometimes it's hard to figure out where to know uh, where to start in smelling it. Sometimes these smells kind of morph and, and blend together so that it's hard to pull one smell out from, from another. And it's a moving target. You know, you have development in the glass just like you do with wine. Um, I think, yeah, it's quite tricky, but I think the, I mean, the thing for someone beginning, I would say read about it as well. Um, you know, if you buy a bottle of whiskey, read what different writers have written about it and see what you can confirm or deny. There's an element of being influenced by that that you have to be careful of. I think if you if you want to really learn about um, tasting, you should do it in a blind setting. Um, and then there, what you're relying on is contrast. You know, you have two different samples at the same time or, or more if you're being served the whole flight at once. And you can say, okay, this one has more red fruit than that one if we're talking about wine, or this one's more tannic and grippy on the palate than that one if we're talking about whiskey. Why would that be? Um, you know, and it depends on, I would say the thing that makes, you know, wine tasting possible is that geographic and, and grape variety difference that sets apart styles and, and types of wine. The thing, though, with whiskey is that you have the vast majority of the flavor coming from man-made processes, production and maturation. And there are so many variables and they're interacting variables that what you have to do is look for evidence of certain types of production techniques and then reference that kind of against your knowledge of how different whiskeys are produced. So it requires quite a database of, of knowledge already to successfully blind taste whiskeys. Um, and I think that's, um, I, find it, I find it a little harder um, or actually quite a bit harder than wine. Oh, that's encouraging. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, I, I remember I was getting cocky about, uh, about tasting and smelling whiskey and I did a, uh, threesome, an Isla threesome. Uh, I basically tried to blind taste and I uh, living by myself, I have to basically pour it into the glass, mark something on the bottom and then, uh, shift them around and try to distract myself so I'm not paying attention to which, where I'm moving stuff, stuff around, the old shell game I'm playing in my brain. And, um, uh, and so I thought, well, I, I'm going to do well at this because I had a, a Lagavulin 9, a, uh, a Laphroaig 10, which to me those two actually were a lot closer to each other than you might expect, and then Ardbeg, which is very ashy. So it was interesting in doing it because I could, I could pick out the um, – Ardbeg every time because mm -hmm. it was so different but the other two I kept getting them backwards and mm -hmm. it made me go okay I you know there is something in this but it was still early on so it's like there is something between these two different types of, of smoke that I'm not picking up on and 
I'm believing one spirit should be this when in reality it's the other spirit. So I see where your blind tasting can be an assist. Yeah, and you know, if a, if a given thing stands out to you at a given point in time and that's the thing you're focused on, you can make a decision in your logic tree that says, okay, therefore, you know, I'm taking these three as candidates and excluding these two. And if you're wrong on one point, the rest of it's all gone, you know, unless you realize it later and backtrack. But it's very hard. And I think there's a lot of discipline involved, um, making sure that that you're not making hasty decisions, that you're not excluding things prematurely. There's a whole strategy really to blind tasting. Um, and it is geared more toward an exam than it is toward appreciation. I think appreciation, um, you know, is different from being able to identify something. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It, let's talk about um, objections because I got into a discussion with somebody on a, on a chat about uh, now, if I go to talk to a uh, bourbon drinker, uh, I will sometimes get from a bourbon drinker. Um, I don't like scotch, which to me, I, I always say, well, that's kind of like saying you don't like food because there are varieties of food. There are varieties of scotches. And so um, how do you tend to try to over overcome that objection? I my answer usually is I can fix that um, <laughs> because I, I mean, there's nobody who's told me they don't like scotch that I wouldn't be able to find. A scotch that they would admit to liking, um, if mm -hmm. if in particular if they're if they are already into spirits of any kind um, or you know find them acceptable. I think one of the hurdles is the alcohol content for some people, and there you may want to start them on cocktails or something else. But the you know if they like tequila but they don't like scotch, or if they like bourbon but they don't like scotch, I think it's only you know a matter of introducing them to the right thing. Yeah. So what's interesting to me is that I never really think about it from the other direction, but I would think it would be harder for a scotch drinker to find a bourbon that they like than it would be for a bourbon fan to like a scot because scotches are aged in bourbon barrels. So there are some bourbon characteristics there. Whereas when you have a, um, when you have a bourbon, the thing I'll hear from a scotch drinker is it's too sweet. Mm -hmm. because of the aggressiveness of the barrel aging and getting it in that fresh barrel um do you find yourself looking for uh, a bridge whiskey that can get them over that hump and because my thought is well maybe if i could just find a really dry bourbon mm. I, I, you know i mean something that it probably has a lot more of like a um uh, or something that maybe has a um, familiar note in it, like a finished cask, mm -hmm. um, w wine cask kind of a version. That's an interesting thought. I think if finishing would um, would influence and make it make it more approachable for some people. Um, I think. I mean, you see that with Angels Envy. I, I get a lot of requests for Angels Envy at tasting events. Maybe that's the reason. Um, but I think the I think the I agree with you. I think it's a little, it's harder to go, at least for me, from scotch to bourbon rather than from bourbon to scotch. I think people naturally like sweeter flavors in, in the United States anyway. That's, um, you know, we're raised on Coca-Cola and um, a little more sweet desserts and things than, than in the rest of the world. If you go and have dessert in Germany, it's not that sweet. Um, it's, it's just something that I, I think kind of matches the American palate. Also the intensity of flavor. Um, it's that just in incredible intensity. You see that in American wine preferences as well. Um, you know, they like often these bold Cabernet Sauvignons. They don't understand what's going on with this, you know, dainty Beaujolais. Um, and, and you know, that's, <laughs> that's maybe how it translates into the world of spirits. Um, but in Scotch, you have both. So if I have a bourbon drinker who likes intensity, who likes sweetness, then I can show them something that, you know, has a heavy sherry influence, um, that has, you know, a lot of intensity of flavor from distillery character um, and usually find something that they like. Um, if they do like, you know, more delicate flavors, then you can find them a delicate space cider or something um, that isn't sherried and, um, you know, usually bring people around that way. So I think you have a few more entry points in scotch because there is such a diversity of flavor, whereas the definition of bourbon 
requires a certain amount of overlap and flavor characteristic that's that's considerable. So I'm having a hard time. I'm studying bourbon now and tasting and preparing to blind taste for it. I find it harder to, than scotch because there is so much coming from those casks and, and um, so little variation. I mean, you can char the casks to different levels. You can toast them. You can, you know, you could do a second cask. You could do double maturation. Um, you know, there are some now that have finishing, but otherwise you're looking at differences of grain bill, maybe of yeast strain, um, things like that. But it's hard to differentiate them, and I think I think harder than um, than even Scotch. I think the advantage I get in tasting on bourbons usually is that I'm such a rye fan that th that the type of rye flavor is kind of like that differentiator for me mm -hmm. in tasting a bourbon so yeah and, but i heard uh, i heard you uh on a um on the bourbon life podcast and it was kind of interesting to hear uh the talk the talk of um blind tasting maker's mark cast strength and thinking mm. it was a high rye whiskey and that everybody was getting it wrong that sometimes yeah. you could be that thrown by something like that that was in the master of bourbon exam that was the first master of bourbon exam i wasn't there i was in my own for scotch but the the um the the panel of judges were tasting blind initially along with the candidates so they make their own notes to keep themselves honest when they're judging later how well did you do and so i think the um everybody just about i, I don't know if maybe there was an exception but thought there was a, a high rye uh component there uh, where there was none <laughs> and so that's kind of a lesson in I like doing things like that in a blind tasting um, because then I want to work out why that could be you know how can that happen right and right. it's well what can give you the flavors and textures and impressions that are similar to a uh, something with a lot of rye in it you know you've got spiciness um, what else can cause the perception of spiciness you know um, alcohol uh, you you can have flavors from from maturation. You can even have you know certain um, flavors from production that come through as quite spicy, and um, and there are other things. You know, it's just it, there's so much interacting there. I try to work out afterward where I went wrong, and sometimes that's helpful. Did you have a moment where when you went back after you started drinking whiskey and then you started drinking wine that you were going? I'm noticing things about wine that I didn't notice before. Um, I don't actually n know. I think um, now I'm finding more in whiskey than I did before. Um, I'm continuing. I'm continuing to to see things in whiskey that wouldn't have been something that I would typically notice um, even six months or a year ago, and. Um, I would say correspondingly wine has become uh, less interesting. <laughs> um, so I, there are some there are some wines that I'm in love with and I tend to gravitate toward those types and I've um, you know many people over time they go out and explore lots of different wines and then they kind of narrow down what their wine categories are and um, I've never wanted to do that I've always wanted to taste widely but um, you know I'm going back to the same four or five regions all the time and looking for more interesting expressions of it but um, I'm spending more time analyzing my whiskeys than I am my wines. It's really interesting because I, was, I went to Missouri wine country many, many years ago, and I went to the town of Herman, and I went to this one particular winery, and I tasted through all the wines that they had to offer, and I walked out going, I, I don't know. I really don't know. I left with a bottle, but I was kind of not, not sure what I had just gone through. And then after... I came back years later after doing whiskey tasting. It's like I taste I taste the oak in this. I'm mm -hmm. tasting things in this. Now I'm actually paying attention to the flavors that are in this. And I think that's what's kind of fun about switching between and seeing how your palate has um progressed over the yeah. years. Yeah, to, definitely. And I think too, you know, it's it's an, uh, just like oh, I don't like scotch, well, let me find you the right one. Same thing in wine. You know, if somebody says, I don't like red wine, I only like white wine, I'm like, okay, well, yeah. try this one for me and see what you think. 
Um, so, so I always yeah. use this example because I say, you know, the, the the thing that I started off with with whiskey was that I didn't really want to drink drier whiskeys, and maybe that was the American palate thing coming through. But I had a um, Beaujolais, it was, and I thought, I thought it sounds so wonderful, and then I opened it, and it was so fruity on the nose, and I, I was like, this is going to be great, and then I poured it, and it just tasted, it was so dry. Mm. I, I can't really describe it at the moment, but there was no fruit yeah. <laughs> I could taste. And I was like the disconnect between, is that a characteristic of Beaujolais or is that, uh, is that something that was probably just that particular vineyard? Um, it could be the quality level. Um, so in, in Beaujolais, um, often, you know, in France in particular, but in, in Europe generally, um, the, the appellations can be a little bit confusing. Um, so Beaujolais, if it only says Beaujolais on the bottle, that just means that every grape that went into that wine has to be grown within the Beaujolais region. Um, if it's not an estate bottled wine, those could be sourced from all over the place. And then maybe there's kind of a least common denominator character rather than an individual character from a particular vineyard. Um, the appellations though, um, you'll then see Beaujolais village, which indicates it has to come from one of the village appellations um, within um, or within that level of, um, of narrowness in terms of identification. And then you'll see things like um, Morgon, Fleury, uh, Moulin Avant. Those are different um, villages where if it comes from that particular place and you have the winery, you know, you're know you going to have an interesting um, distinctive character um, that may be better than just if it says Beaujolais on the bottle. So the broader the naming, the generally the the less interesting the wine is likely to be, um, but the okay. I would say too it, they're going to be very dry. They're they're dry fermented. They're all the you know the all the alcohol is converted or all the sugars converted over to alcohol um, with tiny tiny amounts of residual sugar. So there won't be any sweetness. Um, you may get astringency. You know those are going to be high acid wines generally. Um, they go through a process. Um, some of them or many of them do um, called carbonic maceration. Um, so it's, uh, it creates these kind of bubblegum type of fruit flavors and, and, and kind of small red berries mm. and things like that. So you get this huge promise on the nose of this, you know, fruitiness. And then on the palate, it may be kind of thin and watery and even astringent. <laughs> okay. That's interesting because, you know, in the world of whiskey, I tend to really appreciate whiskeys that deliver on the nose and deliver on the palate the same experience mm -hmm. it's kind of like okay the distiller has figured out how to you know translate a beautiful nose into the palate which i think is a rewarding uh experience yeah the, well and th with wine you have to think about the added dimension of food most whiskeys you know people nowadays are beginning to talk more about pairing spirits with food but wine has always been produced in a way that it was meant to be a handmaiden to food and so if you think about the experience of a wine, you know, what would we amp up to make it go better with food? Well, you know, we would amp up the acid because acid stimulates the palate, gets the saliva flowing, it begins the digestion process. Um, it, it clarifies the, you know, the flavors on the palate. Acid and salt are the two ways that chefs, um, not, it's not an addition of flavor, it's an amplification or magnification of the flavor in your food. So seasoning, they're basically, you know, when you produce a high acid wine, you have an effect of seasoning your food with it. And um, so those are things um, to consider. Generally, French and Italian wines are not something you're going to enjoy as much on their own um, as you are with food. And, you know, American wines tend to be made, uh, many of them tend to be made to stand alone in the same way that a scotch can. So would you say that when it comes to because i don't know how much uh pairing you have done in terms of of whiskeys when i think of whiskey pairing i always think of simple pairings like you are taking uh a little uh piece of chocolate and you're pairing with that or strawberry or whatever it may be you're just pairing it with a small item instead of a a whole meal but maybe this idea that when you're using like one that we're we're gonna i'm gonna pull out here to taste here in a moment that has really heavy wine character mm. to it that maybe those end up being more your dessert or your dinner whiskeys rather than your dessert whiskeys. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I like the idea if you're going to have whiskey with a meal, I like the idea of thinking through which course you're going to have it with. 
I think that's the right level of analysis. And then you want to look for complementary flavors and avoid clashes. Um, with wine, you can go a little more narrow. You can have a bit more of a kind of a hand in glove fit between wine and food. Um, I think that's harder to do with 40 plus percent alcohol because alcohol is mm -hmm. something that clashes with or, or overcomes many things that you're going to get from food. So, um, or it can even be very bad with very spicy food, for example. Um, so I think it's, uh, it's harder to pair, but I think you can, you can organize a meal, um, in a way that highlights it. You can also decide that you're going to feature the whiskey or you're going to feature the food, you know, which one's going to take importance. Right. Yeah. So, um, I had this interesting bottle that I bought the other day and I was looking at it on, I've seen it on the shelf multiple times and I just kind of passed by it, but it was from one of my favorite distilleries, which is the Ben Romit distillery, uh, in Speyside. It is a small distillery. Uh, they do their own floor maltings part of the year. It's just, uh, kind of one of those places, another place I really want to visit one of these days. And, um, this was a it was a Sask sasakaya so it's one of those names i look at and i go i have no idea what that is whereas you know the wine lover comes over and goes oh that's interesting in a whiskey um and so what was interesting about it was it first got me to actually as i was tasting it i was going i am tasting things i really don't think i've ever tasted in whiskey before i am lost and so i went and found myself going to tasting notes for Sasakaya to see if I could figure out what flavors it was mm. bringing. So as a, as a wine drinker, uh, a port wine drinker, so on and so forth, uh, do you find that these distilleries are giving, the, um, giving enough of an impact of that wine to really make it uh, a good bridge or something that that somebody would would taste and go yes i definitely pull that particular uh wine out of this particular whiskey yeah i think it would be hard to i mean you can i think get categories of notes from from a wine i think dessert wines are a bit different um i tend to get many more distinctive characteristics um, dessert and fortified wines i get distinctive characteristics um the like red wine casks uh think about what's going on you have something that's maybe 15 percent alcohol interacting with the cask as against you know previous fill of something like a bourbon that would have been you know much higher so what you have with red wine casks often i mean it can be from it can be flavors from the red wine like fruit or berry flavors and even a little bit of a color tint in many cases um, or even tannin. I mean, if you have uh, if you have Cabernet Sauvignon grapes, um, you have very tannic wine, uh, and then you have tannins prob that may maybe are not you know fully clean from the barrels. Um, that could influence that as well as as well as the tannins from the barrels. But I think the 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 one of the things that a wine cask does differently from like a, a previously filled spirit would have been um, often just the ratio of alcohol soluble flavoring compounds being added by the cask as against water soluble. So you've, you know, with wine, you've extracted a lot of the water soluble, although wine is usually aged for a much shorter period of time as well. So you have a fairly active fresh cask that hasn't had many of those alcohol soluble components um, pulled out yet. This is uh, to kind of describe this particular wine it is made it was actually it's an italian wine but it's was uh the bringing in of french vines as i understand Ca cabernet and um uh another french vine as well were brought in for this to to kind of grow it yeah the broader phenomenon here is the super tuscan movement um super being in the latin sense of beyond um tuscany so you had a movement of Italian winemakers saying, you know, we have some evidence that grapes from outside of Italy can grow really well here and produce high quality wines. Under the existing classification system, they would have been required to call them table wines, basically the lowest quality grade possible. 
but eventually some of these wines were selling for hundreds of dollars per bottle while being labeled low quality table wine. And so you had something that kind of had to be rectified there. Um, regulations were changed. You have um, appellations set up to recognize um, you know, French grape varieties being grown in particular places in Italy. This is centered around um, the village of Bulgari. Um, but you see Tuscan wines more broadly have been influenced by this and that um, even Chianti um, and other types of wines that involve blending Sangiovese in Tuscany with, with other grape varieties. Um, Chianti has to be 80% Sangiovese. The, rema the remaining 20% used to be composed of uh, lesser known local Tuscan grapes, red and white, but now you're more likely to find Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, and French grapes making up the balance. So that's been really influential in Italian wines um, and in other places, you know, um, outside of Tuscany. So Umbria makes a lot of Merlot. You see Cabernet Sauvignon all over the place. It's a lot darker than I would expect it to be. I, you know, I think of uh, I think of red wine, but I don't really necessarily think of like tobacco notes and things like that coming through. And then there's like a minerality to this. And then it's there's smoke, but the smoke blends really nicely. It's the Ben Romic mm -hmm. smoke uh, because they use a little bit of, of peat in their uh, in their mm -hmm. distilling. But um, uh, but then it's on the on the palate that I really start picking. It's like I I get berries, raspberries, and then all of a sudden I get this tannin mm -hmm. note on the finish. All right, what do these are these normal? Uh, well, I say normal. What size barrels are they probably using to store this this wine in? Is it? Uh, I I would believe they're probably using French barrique, um, which are which are smaller than American standard barrels. Um, they, they're, they're the, the barrels that, um, come from Bordeaux region, um, uh, generally they have slightly different shapes, um, coming from Burgundy, but, um, they have, it's a, it's a, it's, you would be, it would be French oak, uh, in that case. Uh, I'm not sure if they're using any American oak. If they are, they would probably be using, um, new American oak barrels. They started with, um, I don't know how long this ages initially. I think actually i do it's six years in uh ex bourbon and then it's uh it's two years in these french casks and when you look at the color of this and and the flavor is so punchy from the wine cask rather than from the traditional ben romic flavors that you kind of expect that it makes you think this that maybe this is too long that uh, you know un unless you're really looking to sell somebody on um, not having to spend all, because apparently this is not an inexpensive mm. wine. So here's your opportunity to taste that wine without having to um, buy the actual wine. Yeah, I mean, I would expect it to be tannic um, because tannins, if you put, um, first of all, there are 10 times as many tannins in uh, French oak as there are in American oak. So um, if you're finishing with a French oak, those tannins are some of the things that extract fastest. Um, you're going to have, uh, you know, the impression of tannin color, other things um, coming through. There are some things that take a lot longer to um, extract from the cask, and then there are things that also um, resolve over time. Tannin, in the presence of, you know, oxygen as it naturally permeates um, the oak of a cask, can polymerize, can form you know, chains and sort of fall out of uh, solution and then not end up in the whiskey um, or they can end up being softer, a bit more velvety. You get that with aging wine in a bottle. The tannin is is going from something that's um, perceived as kind of unripe and green and stemmy and astringent, um, like a black tea bag. You know, if you ever had that last sip of tea, it's quite textural. Mm -hmm. um, those with time um, and oxygen can become something that strikes you as more velvety and, and supple. And so um, counterintuitively, maybe it needs a lot longer in the cask um, to resolve that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, did you, because uh, um, I have my whiskeys here. I think you had some that you were uh, going to suggest along with this. So is, is that a, um, a wine cask there that you're uh, 
So what I have, I, um, I'm i sticking to your distillery choices, but I have different bottlings here. So I have the I have the Benoma. Okay. I have had the one that you are having. Um, I actually had it in Kentucky, fun, funnily enough. Um, but, oh, okay. <laughs> um, that's where I buy all. That's where I buy all my okay. scotch. <laughs> <laughs> but um, <laughs> no, it's and it was beautiful. I remember it. Um, but I have the Ben Roma fifteen. Um, so looking for kind of that similar what's coming through from the distillery. Um, but I know since we're talking about wine and finishing that they're selecting from ex bourbon and ex sherry casks um, to produce this whiskey. Um, it's always a question, by the way, when we talk about X sherry, which oak species are we talking about? Because that can make a huge difference mm. for the flavors um, that come through. The majority of sherry casks nowadays are American oak. So that can be a little more complicated if what you're expecting is something amber, red, tannic, you know, things like that, which would come from European oak. Yeah, and it's a lot more seasoning, probably less time. I mean, I think that's what makes this different is that as I understand it, Sasakaya goes probably 18 years or so in in a barrel. So it, it actually is an aged uh, spirit or wine versus a uh, uh, something that may just be seasoned for a short period of time just to get the flavor into the well, barrel. Well, the wine, um, the wine would age for a much shorter period of time um, in, in the cask, and then they would move it over to the bottle. Mm-hmm. Um, to finish that aging. So if they're holding it back for a long time before release, most of that time's going to be in bottle. Yeah. The uh, the time in the in the wood um, generally is going to be you know two years something like that um, for for something like that. So it's a uh, okay. It it has a lot less time to get um, to get some of what it would out of it uh, out of the barrel. So there's a lot left in a wine cask for a whiskey to to uh, absorb if it's going to be in there at higher alcohol and for 10 years or more. This is what threw me when I first got into whiskey because the first bottle I got was a 16 year old scotch and I said well I'll just hold on to that bottle for a couple years and then it'll be a 18 year old scotch (laughs) and I didn't realize that it doesn't and then I now since I've been so in the whiskey world I forget that wine actually ages in the bottle where so so what is the what is the difference? Why is it aging in the bottle versus uh, I understand the the whiskey side of it, but I less understand the wine side of it. Yeah, um, you know I don't know if I can do a satisfactory job on on the chemistry of that, but the I think what if you think about what's left in a whiskey after distillation um, and then after maturation, you have. The, the vast majority of what's in a whiskey bottle is either water or ethanol. Um, it's a tiny amount. It's like a third of a percent are the congeners that give flavor to the entire thing. And those are mostly composed of, um, you know, esters, aldehydes, um, lactones from the oak, things like that, uh, ketones, other other chemical compounds um, that, and, and, and some tannin, other things, but that don't um, maybe necessarily interact as much as if you're not going through that process of distillation, you know, you still have everything that was pressed out of the grape juice. Um, it's still the vast majority water. Um, the sugar has been converted into alcohol, but you have all these other compounds, esters, aldehydes, and so on. And, um, you know, you still have something that is a bit more active. There are many, the larger percentage of those things that are still there to have any kind of chemical reaction that they are going to have with one another. Um, I would guess there's still chemical reactions going on between flavor congeners and a whiskey, but they're just such a small part of it. And, yeah. um, you know, maybe something about the fact that it's distilled, um, you know, reduces the possible activity of that over time. I think, I think the thing that I find in whiskey is that it's the more uh, oxygen that gets to it if you leave space in a bottle i can put a bottle of whiskey up on the shelf that has you know that much room of of air at the top of it and if i leave it there for two years there is a change in yeah. the whiskey and i have some whiskeys uh Abelauer is a good example of this if i get an, an Abelauer 12 when i first buy the bottle i don't like it yeah. but something happens in that bottle once it sits on your shelf for six months with some yeah. air in it that makes it really great whiskey and so 
the, I think something with the uh, with the air getting in there allows oxidization to go on in a different form than it goes through in a. Yeah, barrel. I think you're dead on. Many whiskeys I'm not impressed with on first taste. You know, I'll have a dram or two, let them sit there because I'm drinking everything I'd rather drink. And then I come back to them and I think, what was I thinking before? This is fantastic. <laughs> so I agree with you. I think that yeah. helps quite a lot. Um, you know, it's the same principle in wine. People know about decanting a wine. Um, you can accelerate the absorption of oxygen right before drinking it. And it really brings out the expressiveness and, the, and it integrates the flavors and um, makes it much more pleasant. But at the same time, you get diminishing returns. That bottle is not going to last overnight. Um, you're going to have oxidized wine, which basically is, you know, damaged aroma from from too much oxygen. So there's a really nice balancing point, and I think whiskey has that too. And even in the dram, you know, you, or in the glass, you have a. I have I know people who insist on sitting out for thirty minutes before they drink it. Yeah, that's the uh, uh, m m the rule I heard was one minute for every year it was in the uh, in a cask. Yeah, is the way to go to to let it settle down, and it it it, it seems to make a difference uh, whether it necessarily makes it better or not. You know, that's the interesting thing is if you're doing a whiskey tasting and you uh, you know I'll go to a whiskey tasting and I'll see them pouring something out immediately that's an aged whiskey. And I'm thinking, you know, what would the experience be like if they'd poured those all out ahead of time and they were just sitting there breathing, getting the opportunity to let some some air in? Um, is that do you have a strategy with that? Do you like having it poured at the moment or poured ahead of time? Um, I like I do like to let it rest a bit. I think it's I think and, and I also disturb it with a couple drops of water, usually um, not for purposes of dilution, but just for purposes of kind of breaking up the chemical uh, tension in the glass and letting those aromas sort of begin um, moving around and emerging. I think there's a difference of the accessibility of flavor, you know, if not the quality, it, you maybe still have, I don't know if it's, if it's right to say it's improving, but what you're doing with air is making it available to your senses, it seems to me. Mm. So, yeah. It's amazing. It, it's amazing how some whiskeys that I will uh, pour it and I'll set it over to the side and I can smell it and I'm nowhere near yeah. it. <laughs> it's like it's over there, but it just hits you. And other whiskeys that you have to stick your nose all the way in and just draw about as hard as you can draw and you, you, you just can't get much of a scent out of it. That a spirit could be that yeah. different. Well, amazing. and that's another way where I think it's helpful to have a very knowledgeable person helping you when you get started tasting a lot because you're going to wonder if it's your fault or the whiskey's fault. And it's often the whiskey's <laughs> fault. You know, some of them are not that expressive. Yeah. They're not that, um, they don't show really clear and distinct flavors. They can be pleasant. Um, the question after that is what did they promise? You know, if they, <laughs> if it's, uh, you know, if it's if it's clearly a budget selection or if it's something that's meant to be, um, you know, something a little more rarefied, you may then think how to, you know, think about what you think of the quality from that perspective. But, yeah, I think you um, you have to be careful with those selections when you're beginning to taste because you may feel like you're just not getting it and it just may not be there. Well, another interesting way that I tried to develop my nose and palate was when I started doing YouTube videos, I would do pairings. So I would I would do this whiskey versus this whiskey and try to find two that were sort of close to each other and then try to describe each as I'm tasting them. And I've sort of brought that back on Mondays on YouTube where I do a matchup. Um, but what's interesting is now as my palate has evolved, I've started to realize the importance of putting one whiskey ahead of another because uh, I did a tasting where I did a Shackleton whiskey. Shackleton has a very strong nose to it and it's got some muscle behind it. And I was smelling it versus a Dewar 12 mm. and that Dewar 12, I could not smell anything. It's like I went, okay, I got the Shackleton. Now there's nothing here. And what was funny about that was I talked about it during the, the tasting and I was like, you know, I, I'm sort of disappointed in this 12 because it's not really giving me much of anything to go on. And so I was downgrading it. Later that night, I decided to pour myself a, a tumbler of it. I was watching TV 
And I said, okay, well, I'll just sip a little bit of it. And all I was tasting was like gingerbread. And I was going, wow, this is so good. And I've just dissed it on my video, but it's just time and place and actually not having it, you know, having it um, in its own space rather than putting it through that kind of a comparison or maybe lining whiskeys up and saying, here, we're going to go through a tasting. And the importance of having, you know, those matched up in a way to where you don't create a disappointment out of something that, you know, it does have its own story to tell. Oh, totally. Yeah. And I think if you, I mean, you would definitely want to organize a tasting um, in a way that you're going from, you know, lighter to heavier in terms of intensity and things like that. Um, in a blind tasting context, like for the exam, my first thing to do is go through and find the peated whiskeys, push those back so that mm. I don't taste them before something unpeated yeah. and delicate. And then next what would be, you know, are there any cask strength here? Do I think by, by appearance and by, um, first impression, if so, push that back. And then is there anything heavily sherried, um, you know, with some big or some big port finish or something like that? Um, that is going to trample all over, you know, um, <laughs> the more delicate whiskeys that may appear in the lineup. So you're kind of eliminating those um, those that may have undue influence on the rest of the flight. Let's talk uh, and dive a little bit into the idea of blind tasting because I avoided it for a long time. And the reason I avoided it was because um, I, 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 got, I was of this opinion for a little while that um, part of the experience of drinking a whiskey is even in the branding of mm -hmm. the bottle. Or and, and, and I went to Amsterdam and I went to the Bowles Museum and uh, the Geneva Museum and they had this really cool uh, room that you go into and it would, when you're in the room, they give you this liquid and you put the liquid in your mouth and then they shine different colors on your face while you're looking at yourself in the mirror and the flavor changes as you're sitting there watching these different colors hit mm. you in the face and it was such it was such an interesting experience and um i realized that i can drink a whiskey in one room with my eyes open and the sunlight beaming in on me and then i can walk into another room where it's darker and drink the same whiskey nose and smell and, and taste the neck the same whiskey from the same glass same time period and get a completely different experience out of it. So in, in a way, uh, I got to a point where I said, I don't want to do blind tastings because I, I, I want to have the full experience. If you see a black Jack Daniels bottle, you got a certain personality in your head and, and that kind of, it's that connection between your brain waves and everything, all the other stimuli that goes along with that tasting. So where where is the... What is it uh, and when is the right time to be doing blind tasting? Yeah, I know. I mean, I think that sets up a perfect distinction um, between appreciation, which is the full picture. I mean, that's what we're all going for in the end. Um, there's no point in identifying these things if we're not going to uh, end up appreciating them. They're, they're products made for the purpose of enjoyment. So I agree with that um, from a from an enjoyment perspective, I think the place for blind tasting is to train yourself to uh, observe what's there with minimal bias. Um, and so, you know, if you already know what something is supposed to taste like, you're likely to find those flavors. And, you know, that that's no hindrance to enjoyment. So maybe that's fine in that context. But in the context where where someone wants to know, you know, how much am I actually perceiving through my senses and through my process of reasoning about a whiskey, you know, for testing for if we're testing a master um, examinee, or um, if we have other more narrow purposes like evaluating the quality of a whiskey, you want, you know, you want to be able to know what you're being influenced by. And if marketing is a factor, it's ultimately going to be a factor for consumers. But the consumers often look to judge panels, for example. Um, I was on the international whiskey competition um, a couple of months ago as one of the judges. And we do everything blind because we want to have, you know, exactly the same conditions and then a fair assessment of, you know, um, dozens of different factors 
about a whiskey um, to give the consumer a sense of quality, uh, what quality they can expect from it, you know, separate from any influence of marketing. So, you know, those are some of the purposes, I would say quality um, evaluation, and then learning and then examination of, of knowledge. So give me uh, give me sort of a strategy here in terms of doing a blind tasting. I'm thinking because uh, here's the thing. If I drink, I, I totally get the point of my brain will go. If I know I'm drinking a bourbon, my brain will go right to, OK, look for the look for the caramel, look for the oak, look for the uh, vanilla, maybe find some butterscotch notes in there. You know, you have the particular uh, rye flavor coming through is it there is it not there um when somebody puts a, a a glass in front of you and you have no idea what you're uh, what you're going to be faced with and as i understand you do something like eight different whiskeys during the blind tasting for for your mm -hmm. certification um how do you um how do you practice for that how do you um how do you try to approach that is there a, do you first try to identify in your own mind by doing the tasting am i tasting a bourbon or am i tasting you know a scotch or am i you know or or is there a different route that you take? yeah so my the exam i've done so far was only for scotch so that makes that a lot easier um going forward i will have to <laughs> i will have blind tastings that you know have different um have scotch japanese irish you name it so um, I think that's a level yeah. up on difficulty. Um, you know, for scotch, it's, you're thinking about what are the most important variables. You know, um, if it doesn't strike you right away that there's a particular distillery character here that you just happen to know, which is a big important part of it. I, nobody's going in just going down a list of tasting notes. The first thing you perceive in a whiskey is the total, you know, and then you start dissecting it and, um, you can ask questions about what's evident from production processes, what's evident about maturation from what's in the glass, um, what's, what do you think the probable ABV is? Uh, you know, if you know that the ABV in your estimation is in a certain place and that contradicts an earlier impression you had about what this might be, um, then there's a lot of kind of textbook knowledge of the whiskeys themselves and what's produced in the core ranges of different producers um, that helps you to narrow down what you think it is. Um, so I would say those kinds of considerations are, are the main thing. The, there's a lot of practice too. So, um, I bought most of the core range bottlings of, um, all the distilleries that, that were eligible to be on the exam, which they do publish that list, but the number of bottlings is still more than about 150. So <laughs> doesn't help you wow. too much. Um, <laughs> Good luck. But you yeah, know, if, yeah, you, if yeah. you strategically purchase whiskeys that you think are going to show you the distillery character, maybe more than the mature character. So for example, I'm more likely to buy a 12 year old if I'm preparing for an exam than I am to buy an 18 year old. Um, because I want to see, I want to see that through line that is more likely to appear in many of the whiskeys from that distillery rather than the influence of the cask, which may be similar to the influence of the cask across many different distilleries. So kind of what are the, what are the handles, what are the holding on points that you're going to be able to use to identify these things? Do you, cause you traveled Scotland, mm -hmm. correct? You went to some distilleries yeah. in Scotland. Did you feel that helped you a lot in terms of, uh, when you go see Glen Morangy's big, tall swan neck stills that all of a sudden you're like, okay, now I understand from the process that, you know, that's going to create a lighter character. So if I get a lighter character in that whiskey and, uh, it's, it may lean towards being a Glen Morangy. Yeah. And you can also though, you can also confuse yourself, um, with that because there are a lot of ways to end up with a light whiskey. And, you know, mm -hmm. if you, pick up on the wrong one, um, that can lead you, you know, to a wrong guess. So it's really got to be the totality. Yeah. Um, you know, you're almost a jury in a courtroom, you know, weighing all the evidence and then deciding what you think it is. Um, because any one piece of evidence can be seriously misleading. <laughs> 
Yeah, so here is a good example of how you could be led astray, which this is the uh, Glenmorangie Quinta Rubin, which is uh, port wine finished. Uh, as I understand it, um, it spends 12 years in a bourbon barrel, two years in a uh, ruby port barrel. And the best I can describe this particular whiskey is that it is... Um, I don't know if you've ever had uh, Basil Hayden's Dark Rye mm -hmm. before. But Basil Hayden's Dark Rye, they basically pour um, port wine into a mm -hmm. bourbon or into a rye. So the rye disappears. All you taste is the, um, the, the port wine that's in that. And it's almost syrupy. I, when I tasted it, I was like, I, I could just pour this over mm -hmm. uh, ice cream. This would be excellent over ice cream as a syrup rather than drinking it because it's yeah. so sickly sweet in a way. Uh, and this is a, this is a Glenmorangie, but this is uh, longer in the barrel. And the Ruby Port has such an influence on it. I guess the question being, um, as you're putting together these um, these tasting uh, sets of, of, of glasses that you're doing, do you try to trip people up with? whiskeys like this or do you try to stay close to the um, distillery character yeah i mean i think there are for the council there are there are things that um would be considered fair game and and not um i think there's a question always with finishing is this an iconic um, product for this distillery because all things being equal you'd probably want to show something from a distillery that's going to be core range an essential expression of that distillery that you're more likely to find out in the wild but for Glenmorangie you know um, the finishing is an essential part of their identity and and that's a core range bottling it's not one of the experimental you know limited release uh, bottlings that's something that they produce um, or have had available at least for for many years now and so that's something I think people could be expected to know. Um, and there you'd, your strategy would be to try to identify that this is finished as such. Um, what do you think it's finished with? Mm -hmm. That it's port finished? If you know that it's port finished, then you can think through what are, what are port finished whiskeys that I think are eligible to be on this exam and then maybe narrow it down from those. And uh, Quinta Ruban would certainly be I would say an iconic enough one to appear on the exam though I'm not I've I've had to um, I, I worked on the level one and level two exams with the council but because I was a candidate for the scotch exam I had to be separated from anything having to do with the master level exams up until that point so I haven't made any of those decisions but I kind of know the philosophy yeah. of, of the people making the decisions <laughs> It's so interesting because when I think of uh, Glenmorangie, the original ten, it's like it's a to me it's very citrusy, uh, and I don't get really the citrus in this. It goes into grassy tobacco, leather, uh, and then the raisins and and the rest coming in, uh, and then it's really nutty on the finish. So I kind of get like peanut butter and jelly uh, on the on the finish of this whiskey. So it's just really, like I say, to me the uh it it makes me feel like to be a good especially scotch whiskey taster you almost need to go find those bottles of port wine and understand what the origin of all of these different tastes and smells really are yeah and there's also there is a confusing aspect i think it's um people can get the arrow of causality backward and think that it's the beverage influencing the cask and then the cask influencing the whiskey. Um, that's true in certain dimensions, but in other dimensions, it's that what's going into the cask for its first fill is being influenced by the cask, more, much more than the other way around. So pe like for example, bourbon, the flavor of bourbon comes from the cask, really. I mean, it's if you just taste mm -hmm a majority corn whiskey with other grain whiskeys, they're not influencing the barrel. Uh, the barrel's influencing the spirit. And then what's happening when that is filled again with a scotch, it's not that it tastes like 
bourbon because the bourbon was in it. It's that the bourbon tastes like bourbon because it was in the cask. And then the scotch tastes like bourbon related flavors because it was in the cask. So that's a, that's a, and I mean, and it runs both directions depending on which, which beverage we're talking about, because with a lot of these sweeter desserts, you get, you know, um, free sugars being lodged into the woods. You have lots of berry flavors being deeply soaked into the wood, um, color, those sorts of things. And those are certainly coming through in the final product. So that's kind of a, a nerdy, um, side side note but i think it's got to think about because it's it's going in both directions yeah well i think one of the things that i ran into early on that really threw me was uh i get this concept in my mind that sherry would be uh as we head towards the the last whiskey here uh that sherry is something that is always going to be fruity and what I was shocked by was that when I had um, uh, Lefroy cask uh, of Amontillado finish, um, it was, uh, I was like, okay, wait a second, I'm not picking up as much fruit in this. And so I went and bought some Amontillado and tasted it. And I, was, I said, this is like almonds. I mean, it doesn't taste fruity to me at all. It was... Uh, um, a very different kind of a personality. And um, I think that can sometimes the, the we hear wine finish or we hear uh, port wine finish or we hear sherry and we just assume a particular flavor. Yeah, and sherry um, has such a variety of products under that category. Um, so if you think about um, they make sweet um, wines from the Pedro Jimenez grape, um, which are p- only partially fermented. So they stop the fermentation so that there's residual sugar that hasn't been converted by the yeast. And then they're fortified um, to to stop that fermentation, essentially. And so they have a higher alcohol content. But then you have cherries that are made um, more like a wine. They are uh, They're only fortified to a smaller degree. And after the fermentation... Um, and then the yeast are still um, able to survive and to create this this uh, floor they call it this kind of um, thick layer on top of the on top of the wine in the barrel um, that has oxygen above it and they create these incredible flavors that come from the yeast themselves you get these bready nutty and other kinds of flavors whereas the other types of cherries if you're fortifying them to the point that the yeast can't survive they're only aging oxidatively, like a whiskey does, um, with oxygen very slowly moving through the cask. Mm. Um, so very different flavors, different grape varieties. The um, the cherries that are uh, that are made to be dry and having that yeast flavor are usually going to be, or they're going to be um, white wine. So they're starting from the Palomino grape, not the um, not the Pedro Jimenez. And then on the sweet side, you also have Moscatel. Mm. Um, but so they have different grapes, different processes, different um, different effects. We're going to increase the sales of wine for, amongst whiskey <laughs> drinkers uh, this week. Yes, <laughs> go out and try these. And so, um, so talk about that eighteen-year-old because uh, I haven't had the eighteen. I've had the ten, and I've had. Uh, uh, you know the the core line stuff, but um, but I haven't um, tried the older yes. expressions. And you said this is an Oloroso. Or, so yeah. this is so it's a complicated um, maturation actually. So the eight, the Glenmorangie eighteen. Um, so I'm keeping up with your distilleries, but different bottles. Um, it is thirty yeah. percent of it um, after fifteen years goes on to be finished for three additional years in Oloroso casks. So you get a sherry influence, okay. but it's thirty percent of the make, and it's for three years. Um, and Oloroso is not um, going to be one of the sherries that has these yeasty flavors. Um, it's it's you know oxidative maturation, and so um, you get a lot of fruit. There's there's a lot of fruit in Glenmorangie generally these citrusy fruits, but I think you get a depth of fruit flavor, um, like dried fruits, um, dried mm-hmm. apricots, things like that. That um, likely are contributed by this um, small amount of sherry, but you still have those things that I think are important to Glenmorangie as a house style, which are characteristics that come from bourbon casks. 
um, that vanilla is important um, to to I think Glenmore and G's identity and um, you have a lot of those other typical tasting notes like the um, it's a kind of an almond um, nuttiness you have these nice like light delicate kind of white floral fresh flower perfumey characteristics um, there's a good sweet amount of sweetness to it which I think is, is largely attributable to the sherry casks So what I love is the, the reason why I usually will pull out Glendronic 12 for people who are um, either bourbon drinkers who are interested in getting into scotch or for somebody just starting out with scotch is because, uh, to me, it's that combination of the Oloroso, which has the darker fruits to it, and the PX, which sometimes can be a little sweet for people. It kind of tames the sweetness and pulls in some of those interesting characteristics um, without getting too heavy with the barrel it's like I, I a lot of people find the 15 to be a sweet spot which i i agree but sometimes i want a little less of that wood influence and really to try to get to the uh, the new make uh and what what's left of the new make in that yeah spirit. yeah there's an interesting um for anyone who wants to get really in the weeds on this the book i recommend is um cask management um by matt strickland um, and it goes, you know, into the chemistry of maturation and all the different things that are happening at the same time. It's, you know, um, and, and the, the question is when to stop um, or when to make a change because you're interrupting this process, but you're also preventing this process and things are happening on different time scales and to different degrees. So it's a little bit convoluted. Um, but yeah, you can see like how much, you know, when do we stop getting those pleasant extractives from the cask and start getting a little bit something that's too woody and tannic um, when do we stop um, you know increasing the complexity of the esters through esterification and having the you know when when do we lose the the distillery character because there's too much mature character all of that yeah I think that's fascinating and I agree with you I think 12 to 15 years is a sweet spot for most whiskeys yeah, well, uh, I went to uh, Glen Scotia and uh, I got a chance to taste the new make, and I was like, "This is so good off the off the still. I don't really know if I want to taste it uh, long age." But the 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 flagship is fifteen years. And I'm like, "Oh, you know, they're going to kill all the flavor out of it," but they don't. It's just the way they manage those casks that they're able to retain the beauty of that new make but also marry it nicely with the casks over that longer period of time. Yeah, and if you look at a place like Glen Farkless, um, they achieve incredible age statements because of their microclimate um, it, for their dunnage warehouses, which mm. basically um, you know, is the closest thing you can get to, to you know, nothing going on <laughs> with, with the maturation. You have, uh, you know, you yeah. have... Um, you know, you have a very, very slow evaporative loss where they are. You have a ton of time um, for all these esters and complex flavors to develop through slow, slow, slow oxygen exposure. Um, you know, you have the right level of humidity. It's cool. It's very consistent. Um, so they can achieve incredible age statements. And then someone, you know, a few miles away may not be able to do that. Um, they can over mature their whiskeys very easily. So it, that is a case where it's not only, it's not particularly regional, it's down to the exact microclimate. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's one of those lessons for people who are going out to buy whiskey for the first time that the, the age doesn't always um, dictate quality yeah. uh, or what your experience is, is going to be. Um, we get in the habit of, uh, I, I hear many times, you know, people talking about Pappy Van Winkle, and I'm like, man, for a bourbon, as much, you know, heat and uh, uh, weather as that's going to go through, I know they protect those barrels down at the bottom of the warehouse, but even at that, that's a long time for a bourbon to be sitting in a barrel. Um, and so you have to determine, is that the flavor profile you're really looking for, or, you know, is it, uh, or, you know, and I think for some people it's just the status and to say that's what I'm mm. drinking um, but you know, for somebody who's really looking to hunt out flavors and figure out what their profile is and, and what they're going to enjoy, um, it's, 
it, it's better to get beyond the the numbers and and dive into the spirit itself and the as you say the the distillery quality uh what it brings to the beer. yeah and you know that's always a question i've gotten about wine too is um you know what's a you know how old should the wine be what's a good vintage and my answer is unfortunately it totally depends <laughs> on you know the vintage quality of that <laughs> year will determine how long that particular age can or that particular wine can age and you know i guess this is why the sommelier profession exists because there is no good rule of thumb um, that applies to everything but if you have you know there are heuristics um but yeah i think age statements can be incredibly misleading and i've heard interesting kind of philosophical arguments about getting rid of them um you know they're not always the best. Age and maturity are yeah. not the same thing, basically. Yeah. Well, uh, going back to my uh, James Bond uh, mode, I, I would count every time I would hear him say, "Oh, I, you know, the '56 uh, Dom Perignon is is the best." I would go, "Okay, that was this film was done in X year, so they're saying nine years. Nine years seems to be good for because that they they would do that every single uh, vintage would increase in in uh, the year along with how long the uh, book was out, you know, when the book was written, and so on and so forth. Uh, we look for these little clues sometimes when we get hung up on." uh on on ages and vintages but i think what's interesting uh i'm starting to sense a little bit there are some distilleries that are talking about doing vintages and i think it's a area of wine that hasn't really been explored so much in terms of whiskey this concept of what what was the weather like during the time period from here to here um that had a certain impact on that particular spirit instead of saying just a pat okay 12 year mm -hmm. whiskey we're thinking wait a second you're talking about uh we had a, a very dry period for three or four years uh, or it was excessively hot for three or four years and that warehouse is going through that experience um and so It'll be interesting to see whether whiskey actually kind of goes in that uh, uh, goes in that direction in in some cases in terms of its try, uh, uh, want mm -hmm. for innovation. Um, but is that something that you pay attention to in wines? Do you do you look for particular mm. years uh, that you go? Yes, that particular wine is going to be much better in that. Totally. Year. Yeah, I think. I mean, for me, in whiskey, vintage is is basically a marker for a particular production run you know you have the distillers edition made in that year and then you have the distillers edition made in that year and they have different characteristics but who knows why um in wine you know yeah. there's such a you know it's probably 30 percent 40 percent variability in quality that that you could sort of arrange a given wine you know same, same exact vines same exact place um, being uh, producing different wine every year, you can have a massive difference in quality um, based on the based on the um, the weather and the characteristics of the vintage, um, which are which are total. I mean, you can yeah. you can have a complete you can have a vintage that's unusable because of the weather, or you can have the best vintage of the century. So, um, you know, mm -hmm. and places like Champagne don't even produce vintage wines unless it's an exceptional vintage. They usually are blending three different vintages together on a rolling basis. Um, so that's the, the standard model. And then um, you have vintages when you have something that you say, well, this is so special, we're not going to dilute it down. Um, we're going to present this as the face of the company. Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, I pay attention to vintages um, and then I pay attention to age more with respect to grape. So some grapes. Um, and therefore some regions, because region and grape are tied together, largely in Europe at least, um, those grapes need more or less time to mature um, their resulting wines um, based on tannin, based on acid, those things. Yeah. So I pay a lot of attention to vintage in wine. Um, it'll be interesting to see what the, what the future of that is in whiskey. For me, right, right now, it has more to do with production runs. Um, if it gets down to where people are saying, you know, the weather was better, um, that'd be interesting because I think right now it's kind of lost in the, in the yeah. 
in in the number of different variables. I, many years ago, I had somebody tell me, "Oh, you know, if you buy Weller, you should buy Weller 12. Uh, it, there are good years of it, and there are bad years of it." And that was the first time I ever really heard somebody say something like that. I would think in a single barrel product, that's where you're really gonna sense that. Yeah, and maybe you know something about their operations, different, you know, um, different dis master distiller, different warehouse. They've changed something about production, anything like that. I did make my pilgrimage to the yeah. Pappy Barrel um, <laughs> at, at Buffalo Trace. Did you? Um, and it's in, <laughs> it's in this. It's yeah. in the you know the lower level of the building in what feels like a Dunnage warehouse because it's a like a brick kind of uh, humid place. So it's if you want long maturation like is possible in Scotland, you kind of kind of mimic yeah. those those conditions. It's fascinating. Buffalo Trace is a great tour to go on to kind of get a exposure to warehouses because that's mostly what you do on that tour. Uh, and we had a guy, the last one that I went on, just the standard tour, he was obsessed with warehouses. So he was telling us all about the character of all the different warehouses. And I think the reason he was focusing on it was because they were building new warehouses. And he was talking about the fact that these warehouses had been built with different materials over a period of, of decades. And that to create these new warehouses, they had to basically figure out how to recreate that same exact material and construction so that they could have a second warehouse that would react the same way as that first warehouse yeah. did. Yeah. No, and you see that um it's fascinating. You see that in Scotland too when they try, when they need to expand production and they produce another set of stills and sometimes they'll have the the dents in the stills mm. <laughs> uh put in the new ones too. Um, yeah. Every little detail. I love I love that about this yeah. industry. Um, I think that's that's an it, important. It is fact. funny. <laughs> I I think it's funny too because it it all depends on who. It depends on the distiller. Sometimes it depends on the country. But if you in you're in the U.S., people will talk about their yeast strains. And then I was going through Scotland the first time, and I would ask about yeast strains, and they're like, "Oh, we just use you know mm -hmm. the standard yeast." It's not like it's anything special, but then you hit particular distilleries that said, yes, mm -hmm. yeast is important. So it's interesting to see the value that each different culture puts on different parts of the process. Um, the, as you say, the Scottish warehouses with the Dunnage warehouses, you don't see a lot of Dunnage warehouses in the United mm -hmm. States, if at all. But there, it becomes a very important part of those historic distilleries and creating. Yeah, the and the character. and the historic styles of particular distilleries are driven by so many different things. I think it's it's romantic to think this was they were all by design, but some of them were just responding to legislation, or it was accidental. You know, you have flat topped stills um, somewhere because they had to chop the top off to fit it in the building, not because they particularly wanted a flat topped still. Um, those kinds of things have gone yeah. around. You've been to Old yeah, Pulteney. exactly Old Pulteney. Um and Is you it, you have you yeah. have things like that <laughs> defining the the absolute character of the products um, that end up being accidental and it's kind of funny. But um, you know, once you have something nice like that and then you want to preserve it, then yeah, you're going to all the trouble to recreate the dents and the stills. Yeah, it was funny when I walked into Old Pulteney and they have this still that is squeezed into the... It looks like a space alien when you first walk in the room and, and then you see it kind of... Uh, the the thing is toppled over this way on the top and it's like, okay, was this uh, was this by design? And it's like, no, it was unfortunately the only way we could fit the thing into the, bu the building, but um, it gives a particular character to that style. It's a heavier style whiskey, which is really interesting to... Note that it mm -hmm. was a happy accident to create a very particular style. Yeah, and we tend to think about individual distillery style. decisions too, but a lot of decisions come from corporate ownership. Um, so you saw in the in the in the sixties and later a lot of distilleries doing things like getting rid of their worm tubs, getting rid of direct firing of their stills, and replacing um, that equipment with uh, steam heated. Um, stills mm 
and those all affect flavor. Um, some of them have, you know, taken out the worm tubs and put them back in, in the case of Dalwini. Um, but some of that is, you can actually watch, you know, when I was preparing for the master exam, I was, I, I would, you know, get details like which distilleries got rid of worm tubs when, those sorts of things, and sort of watch a trend. It's, oh, the, all the Diageo uh, distilleries got rid of them at about the same time, and et cetera, et cetera. Or, I mean, not Diageo, they actually have uh, most of the worm, uh, one third of their uh, distilleries use worm tubs still. But as an example, um, you would see kind of a, a corporate move to replace what was thought to be antiquated or you know hard to keep up equipment, anything like that, and replace it with something more modern, which changed the character. And that's another thing where if you um, you know I have friends who collect old bottles of whiskey, and you can get you know something old that was produced in a different way and taste the difference, and it can be quite astounding. Hmm. This is why I want to go back and grab a um, and find a bottle of Jack Daniels from uh, before 1900, which uh, will be very hard to find. But the reason why I would love to taste it is because, uh, you know, there's always this uh, talk about making whiskey the way they used to make it. Uh, but as I was doing my research, come to find out they used to use yeah. log still. <laughs> So it was a it was a lo it was initially a log still distillery, and if it was that, it's going to be a lot different than those big column stills that they're pumping whiskey through these days. So, um, you know, to say it's the same, no, it's gone through a lot of different different processes. But um, you know, the warm tubs is interesting because uh, Mortlock was it Mortlock? Yeah, Mortlock and um, Old Pulteney. There were certain ones that I went to that I saw those worm tubs and I went, hmm, wonder what that's about. And then you taste the whiskey and it's so much, it's, mm -hmm. it's got more body to it. To me, it's like the oils are still uh, retained in that, in that whiskey. And um, I would assume by your research that most of those worm tubs were probably pulled out prior to this whiskey boom when people really started again, paying attention mm. to flavors and jumping in because I, I would imagine that today we might notice that big of a change, whereas the whiskey drinker it, before 2000 probably was, you know, yeah, it's, I, if I taste a Laphroaig, I know what a Laphroaig tastes like, but I'm probably not going to be overwhelmed by a big change in it unless I'm just, um, you know, massively a fan of that particular Yeah, the big style. changes in the industry as far as equipment that I remember um, were in the 60s, 70s that that kind of period of time which is really before single malts took off um in most places around the world um the first the first single malt that yeah. was available to most people was end of the 60s um was glenfiddich and then you have um in i would say you know you have the classic malts at the end of the 80s um and that that was another big push for recognition of single malt as a category um, so yeah, most people who've come to know and love single malt whiskey, it was after most of that equipment was changed out. Yeah. Well, we, we can probably go on forever, uh, talking about all of this, uh, but let's talk a little bit about, uh, this certification program, because I know there's some people who probably be interested in it. Um, who, who do you suggest that program is best suited to? Um, I mean, so, so there's broadly two types of people who I think go through these certifications. And this is true with the Council of Whiskey Masters, but also wine. Um, I would say it's some people are planning to have a profession as an expert in these fields um, in one way or another. If they're in hospitality, if they work for distributors, if they um, want to be an educator on these topics, if they want to be a writer, anything like that. Um, that's one camp. The others are enthusiastic hobbyists who want to learn all the detail they can about this topic, but they sort of realize they're not going to do it on their own. Of course, you can buy a pile of books, but when you have a deadline, when you have an exam, when you have people you're studying with, you have the camaraderie, you're part of an organization, that helps a lot of people to keep themselves accountable and, and motivated. Um, cause it's not always pleasant to <laughs> study everything you need to study to be a well-rounded expert on the topic. Um, and, and, um, I would say that 
that's probably a good half of the other others who have other careers, usually engineers, attorneys, doctors, people like that. Yeah, not everybody can do like me and just pick up and fly somewhere. And uh, plus, when you talk about all the distilleries I've been to to learn what I've learned about whiskey, uh, I think I've spent probably five, 10, 15 times what it would cost to just go get a certification. Of course, it's a life experience, um, but it's one of those things that, again, not everybody can do. Um, and so talk about the, the tracks on this then. I, th there's different levels and... Uh, you talked about bourbon and scotch as being separate. How does that how does Yeah, that so the out? entry points are separate. You can choose a scotch track or a bourbon track. And there are some people who want to take both exams, but that's a level one exam, um, which is all multiple choice. Um, there's a study guide, um, which is going to be um, something that was written by board members of the Council of Whiskey Masters of the study materials are are written by the board members um, and if anyone wants to see who's on the board um, they're pretty well-known authors and um, industry experts and others who've who've put these materials together and who've kind of um, stress tested the exam itself and seen okay this is a good representative exam of, of expertise at this level um, so there's the certified scotch professional the certified bourbon professional the second level after that um, is a certified whiskey specialist so um, you have the worlds coming together and expanding. So you have to be, you're then responsible for knowing about scotch, about bourbon, and about the rest of the world of whiskey, um, Japan, Canada. Um, there's not much about really new um, kind of frontier regions, but the idea is that you have a, um, a nice overview of well-rounded knowledge of different production processes, things like that. Um, it's not going to be in-depth expertise about each distillery, that sort of thing. It's focused more on theory. What are production differences? What are stylistic differences? Who are the key producers? That, you know, um, important facts at that level. Then I think there's a big jump before you get to the master level. So that's where you may want to spend a couple of years, at least um, in, in some cases. Some people are ready for it early because they knew a lot starting out but you would want to have a lot of time to really understand production in depth, um, have a lot of tasting experience so that you would be able to pass the blind tasting exam, um, which we help with training. Um, you know, you'll have, you, you can always get yourself paired up with someone who's passed the exam to kind of mentor you through the process and help you study and meet with you regularly and things like that. Um, but, and I would say that's actually, that's the point at which the real community aspect of the council comes into play it's kind of you're interacting then at that point with um, a lot of experts in the field and you can ask people to help you as you prepare for the exam and um, you know that's that's the that's the real stressful part of it I think is the <laughs> the fact that so much of that exam is open-ended the theory exam they can ask any question they want um, it's not limited really to any particular domain or set of mm. topics um, there are six essay questions to be answered within two hours the eight whiskey blind tasting exam takes place within 30 minutes um, in terms of the time you have to take your notes and then you have an hour and a half discussion after that um, and then the the thing that hasn't happened yet um, which will happen I think in May in Scotland is the master of whiskey exam level four and that's where you take that master level um, of knowledge and then expand it laterally out to the other areas outside of your track so I was a scotch track but now I'm going to be you still have a specialization. I'll still know more about scotch than I do about anything else, but I have to be well-rounded in that in that exam. Okay, is it uh, on site or is it uh, the master levels are generally on site? The well, the yeah, but the the first first level level one and two um, are done remotely. Um, you take the exams at a scheduled time live okay. um, with a kind of. Uh, locked screen and so on. It's like an, a proper exam um, if you were taking the uh, the LSAT or something like that, but you do all your studying uh, on your own and then it's multiple choice. When you when you get the tasting involved, then it's all in person. Uh, do you dive much into history? Yes, in it? history is a big component. Um, that's I, History actually starts as a component in level one. So the, um, the Scotch exam, for example, is based on a study guide 
um, that I, de I developed with um, Charles McLean based on his book Malt Whiskey, um, which has an extensive overview of mm. the history. And so he updated a lot of that material and we used it in the study guide and, um, you know, important things about history because there's so many vicissitudes of tax law in Scotland that affect things that you don't need to memorize in the level one exam, oh, yeah. but, um, but the, the broad <laughs> thrusts, yeah. Yeah, I started doing a uh, series on Irish whiskey um, and I've gone through 13 episodes so far. And I was digging back in. I'm telling a little bit about Irish history as well as because they, they tie in together so much. But boy, to remember all the different taxes that came through and uh, when they came through. And then also, you know, events like the uh, Scottish Malt Riot in 1725 that changed all the uh, that, that really pushed the, the Scots to drinking uh, whiskey and, and uh, giving up their beer and all of that sort of stuff it's like wow you could really get lost in the weeds on a lot of that stuff uh in terms of trying to uh you'd be overwhelmed just by history let alone trying to figure out distilleries and flavors and yeah and all definitely. the rest but you can tell them they can listen to with whis whis listen to whiskey <laughs> lore podcast they'll uh <laughs> they can they can entertain drive down the road and, and i'll tell people that because go. a lot of the history material has <laughs> been i think probably some people's weakest parts because it's difficult to you know read about one legislative action after the other and uh really come away with a with a vivid yeah. understanding and so if you've gotten into the history with your okay. podcast i think it's definitely better than most most of what's available <laughs> Yeah, well, and it's funny because yesterday was the 200th anniversary, as we're recording this, the 200th anniversary of the Excise Act of 1823. And if you if you look at it, you go, well, all these Scotch whiskey bottles I pick up all have 1823 on it. What was the deal mm -hmm. about that date? Um, and that's the fun part about history because um, a lot of people in in Ireland will tell you that they're not a big fan of Aeneas coffee because he came up with the coffee still, but it was actually, as I was doing my research, come to find out Aeneas coffee had a lot to do with pushing that excise mm -hmm. act to be passed. So, uh, so those are the parts of history that are, are fascinating. And, um, I think they're funner when they're, well, I think it's more fun when it's stories rather than just dates. Uh, and so I think that that's what gets people in. It's like when I was, going through college my history professor said i don't want you to learn dates i want you to understand what happened so that you can yeah. apply it to today and um and i think i think that makes makes history so much more interesting and applicable to um the experience of um helping people yeah and how did how whiskey. did things like that so. um affect the styles of whiskey in different places you know if you want to some of that's still with us today you know, you have traditional styles that develop for reasons that have yeah. to do entirely with historical and, and global events. So um, and that's fascinating. I think what I mentioned, yeah. I, I think I mentioned to you um, once before, um, why are, are Isla whiskeys so heavily peated uh, characteristically where many other island whiskeys are peated, but not to that degree. Um, one reason was they were traditionally used as ingredients and blends and if you were shipping barrels from Isla to the mainland to be delivered as ingredients in a blend, it would be nice if you could get a lot of peat flavor from a single barrel rather than from 10 barrels. Um, so um, they, you know, they came up for that reason as a supplier to blenders, um, but then that became their traditional regional style for which they're known and it became something that people now insist upon. So um, just that sort of thing is fascinating. It's it's interesting that it was well, yeah well, i was gonna say it's interesting that you say that because uh, i was just doing a uh um i do a little home blending and so i was uh taking a bottle of monkey shoulder that i was like this has been sitting on the shelf forever and i don't know if i'm ever going to drink it because to me it's it's um it's more of a neutral kind of a whiskey so um uh so i took a little bit of my sherry oak lefroig and put it in there and I'm like, wow, it tastes like Sherry Oak Laphroaig. I didn't need that much of that Laphroaig to bring that big flavor out. And so it, it, that is one of the things you kind of learn when you start 
uh, home blending a little bit is those Isla whiskeys can be quite potent when you're yeah when you're um, using I them. think and maybe this is a, a homework question for anyone watching I believe that when the Balvany distillery was founded uh, they got their stills or at least some of their stills either from Lefroig or Lagavulin I don't remember which uh, but that's an interesting oh. uh, tie-in what you've done there because you've maybe brought the whiskey back home. <laughs> so Balvenie being one there of the three yeah. single malts. Oh, I'll have to look that blend. up. Yeah, well, I was talking about the uh, Scotland, uh, the Glasgow malt riots, the guy's house that ended up getting burned down. Um, the government compensated him for that, and so he was supposed to rebuild his house with it, but instead, he bought uh, Isla and Jura. Those they, he, they were for sale, and mm -hmm. he said, "Okay, I will buy them." So he ended up buying those two. And his brother is the one that uh, built the Bowmore uh, Church and uh, got the distillery started. So it's really interesting to see yeah. <laughs> these little connections. Uh, and yeah, no, I mean, out. studying history so, sounds daunting, but it's well, uh, uh, it, it, you're rewarded steadily across the process. <laughs> absolutely so if somebody wants to learn more about the the um, certification how can uh, they go about that uh, whiskeymasters.org council of whiskey masters is the is the organization um, you can google that or go to whiskey whiskeymasters.org um, plenty of information there about what's included in the in the different levels of certification process and um, you know who organizes it as far as who's on the board and all that sort of thing and um, yeah, I would say too, if anybody's considering it, you know, if there's someone who's pretty serious about, you know, a career in whiskey that they think would be helped by the program or, um, you know, just wanting to talk to somebody who's been through, um, I'd be happy to talk to, to anyone as well. So um, I can, my last name, Edmondson, um, edmondson.com, they can find me there. Okay, excellent. And I'll uh, post a link to it also on the show notes page as well, so they can just click through there at whiskey-lore.com. Um, Adam, thank you so much for taking us through a journey of wine and whiskey and some history and, and all the rest. Um, again, this is, uh, this is one of those subjects that uh, I don't know that all whiskey uh, podcasts pay attention to, probably the ones more that are dealing with scotch than dealing with bourbon, but I think bourbon people are getting to the point where they're needing to know a little bit about uh, these finishing casks that are making their way over into the U.S. and influencing their whiskeys as well. So I thank you for sharing. Yeah, all, definitely. Wonderful all of your being here. Today. Thank you. It was a pleasure talking to you. And um, I, I think we've uh, done enough damage to this topic. I will, I will look forward to the comments and uh, be, <laughs> be responsive. There. <laughs> no, I think um, it's it's a, it's an important emerging topic, and like you said, in bourbon as well. So hopefully, it's useful to everyone. All right. Fantastic. Cheers. Thank Cheers. You.